So today we're going for a walk to what's been described as one of the most extraordinary places in Britain. I know, I'm so excited, I can't tell you. We're out here on the Suffolk coast at Orford and we're going to Orford Ness. But first we're going to take a look at this really wonderful Norman keep built in the 1160s, I think by Henry II. Looking down across the town of Orford. Now the only way to get across to Orford Ness is via a little ferry which is just down the end of this street here. over there, Orford Ness, for many years the secret government military research establishment. And from here you can actually see some of the, the concrete structures that they use for their mysterious experiments and we'll be over there having a look around that quite soon. Just on the other side of this tidal river here was for many years one of the most secretive places in the whole of Britain. And the remnants of the work that was done there are still there in the landscape. It's a really mysterious beguiling place and I've wanted to go here for many years. So I'm so excited about this trip today. So this area out here was the, uh, was the original military uh, installation on what was once grazing land. This was an airfield for experimentation with, with early aircraft that was established in 1913. Already the first impression is of an incredible landscape. You come over on that little ferry I can tell you that the last boat back is at 20 to 5 and after that <laughs> you're on your own here until April. Today is the last day uh, Orford Ness is uh, accessible. It's the last day they're running the boats over here. After this it's closed. It's operated by the National Trust. Um, so there's a National Trust office at the quay where you check in and then they give you a little briefing on the boat and then when you arrive a gentleman then also gives you a briefing about a little bit of the potted history of how it was grazing land for centuries and then it started to be used by the military from 1912, 1912, 1913, initially just for test flying aircraft and then they went on to testing uh, bombs and bombing and then it became a little bit more experimental during the Second World War and then during the Cold War and uh, the military abandoned the site in the mid-1980s. Uh, the National Trust took it over not long after that and we'll talk a little bit about why they did. It's actually not for this old grazing land here which they've restored to grazing. It's for the Shingle Beach, the Shingle Shoreline which is the longest stretch of vegetated shingle shoreline in Europe. And I think the gentleman says it represents something like 12% of the world's vegetated shingle shoreline, which is, means it must be incredibly rare, right? <laughs> Orford Ness is littered with the remnants of its military occupation and its military usage, some more mysterious than others. And here we have the first signs here, these what were it could have been barracks, I'm not entirely sure. There's these little concrete structures here. There's a lot of concrete on Orford Ness due to the, the bomb blast shelters that were here. It's such a mysterious place. 
There's a, an exhibition about the history of Orford Ness in this little building here. It still contains some of the old electrics on the wall, rusted and frayed wires. What went on here may never be fully known. All personnel signed the Official Secrets Act and did not discuss their work. Much of the work is still classified and many former employees will still not talk about it. What went on here may never be known, may never be fully known because of the top secret nature of it, which is a, it's a kind of chilling thought, isn't it? That even after all this time, there are things that went on here that will forever be suppressed. What I found particularly interesting actually was not the kind of more mysterious post-war, Cold War stuff, but it was like the very origins of it here when they started here in 1913. Aviation was a very new thing, planes were a very new thing. And so they, they didn't know whether an aeroplane could drop a bomb. Could an aeroplane be used in warfare? That was one of the questions they asked and that they tested out on the airfields behind me here. So some of the first bombs to be dropped from a, from a plane were dropped out there. And then once they worked out, well, actually, yeah, you can drop a bomb from a plane, they were like, well, can you put a gun in a plane? Can you put a machine gun in a plane? And what would happen? And there's some of the anecdotes in there of the first times that they fired a machine gun from an aeroplane and they sort of <laughs> blew off bits of the, the tail in the process of doing it. So all these things about them they developed from that, you know, if you're going to shoot at a plane, where should you hit a plane? How should you drop a bomb from a plane? What are the vulnerabilities on a plane? Um, all sorts of things. How do you fly a plane through cloud? All that kind of stuff. And uh, one of the surprising uh, things I found there was that uh, one of the things they encountered, obviously, when flying is that it's cold. The higher you go up in there, it's cold. And they were like, oh, how can we make pilots warmer? So in that period of 1913 to 1917, they came up with electrically heated flying suits for airmen, which they uh, didn't take up. They abandoned it, I think, it's because they thought it might be a fire hazard. <laughs> it's sort of astonishing, isn't it? As I'm walking now, I'm walking through all these remains concrete remains of the various phases of military occupation. Astonishing place. When the site was abandoned in the 1980s they had to work out how they were going to decontaminate it and strip everything away. So they had scrap metal dealers come in and take all the metal out. They had bomb disposal experts they had to scour the land exploding any discarded ordnance and of course originally there would have been loads of it there were loads of dud bombs that fell on the marshland here and had to be retrieved and examined a fairly treacherous job this is also where some of the very first radar systems were tested they wanted to know if you could detect the sound of aircraft as they were approaching which is amazing and there was also an incredible kind of over the horizon radar system that was developed here at one point, they, it was so accurate that they could see everything moving in Russia. <laughs> every train and every bus, they could detect its movements. Which is, which, is, which is an astonishing thought. So you can sort of see why it was such a secluded place, particularly in the Cold War, it's such a secretive place. They were doing cutting edge research here. And I love the various descriptions of this island being populated by boffins. <laughs> I've seen that crop up several times now in descriptions of Orford Ness. The island of boffins, which sounds like a kind of strange, rare bird, doesn't it? So one of the reasons I'm here is because of this, this uh, art installation uh, called After Ness, created by an organisation called Art Angel. And it's, well, it's a series of installations in the old military buildings. And uh, the wonderful, brilliant artist, designer, Joe Hales, who worked on the publication of some poems which have, were commissioned for this installation, he designed the book. And he sent me a copy of the book and said, you must go, you'd love it. So here I am. So this was the uh, photo processing room. One of the things they developed here was aerial photography, the using of uh, espionage. And this is where they would develop the photos. So Orford Ness sits, I suppose you could call it part of a triangle of quite extraordinary locations. You've got obviously this place here, 
But then very close by, you've got um, Sutton Hoo, the famous Sutton Hoo, site of the Anglo-Saxon ship burial, one of the most important archaeological sites in the whole of Britain, if not the most, perhaps. Hmm, that's worth discussing, isn't it? And then nearby that, you've got Rendlesham Forest. And there were two um, very important Air Force bases and obviously scene of the famous uh, Rendlesham Forest UFO sighting, which is one of the best documented and I think one of the most compelling UFO sightings. Whatever happened there was certainly witnessed by an awful lot of um, US Air Force personnel who documented it, so something very much spooked them out on a number of occasions. I've made a video of the walk on the UFO trail you can do around Rendlesham Forest. I'll link to that below. And also a video I made at Sutton Who. Right, we have to now pass over this Bailey Bridge and we're on to the, the section of land that borders the sea and where the really enticing military architecture is and also the Art Angel installations as well. I'm not sure if you can make it out in the picture here, but there are some of the, the radio masts down there, which I think were part of the over the horizon radar system. The uh, early detection system here that they developed was said to have increased the warning time for a nuclear attack from four minutes to 15. Do you remember the four minute warning? during the Cold War. Those of you of a certain age will remember that, or well, the work they did here. Increased that warning time from four to 15 minutes. I don't know if that had made much difference in the result of a nuclear attack, but. The author, W.G. Sabold, came out to Orford Ness in the walks that he did for his, uh, for his book, The Rings of Saturn, which describes a walk down the Suffolk coast from uh, lower Stoft, and he finishes just beyond uh, Orford. I'll put it on the screen. I've actually got the book in my bag with me. I was reading the Orford Ness section on the way here. I previously followed Sebold's footsteps on a walk from Southwold to Dunwich. And he came out, he must have come out here, I think, in the, in the late 80s. The book was published in 1995. I guess it could have been the early 90s, but it was not that long after it had been abandoned by the Ministry of Defence and I guess it must have been before the National Trust took over. And he describes it as being a very desolate and lonely place, a place of crushing loneliness. He says that some of the fishermen that came out here to fish sometimes became quite disturbed by the intensity of the loneliness out here. It really is quite a place. He also talks about the fact that, of course, the locals living just across the creek there. They had no idea what was happening here, so they conjured up all sorts of stories. Imagining what went on here, like imagining things like death rays, all sorts of weird and wonderful things. One of the most chilling speculations, or I suppose myths, about what went on here at Orford Ness was that during the Second World War, the army had a series of pipelines under the sea stretching out into the North Sea that could set the sea on fire in the event of an attempted German landing and that a whole company of sappers had been essentially incinerated during a test that went wrong and that the bodies had been found washed up on the beach or charred. Whether that's true or not, we will never know. And now we really are on the shingle spit which is 10 miles long, an ever-shifting landscape which captures the, the debris, the coastline that's eroded further up the Suffolk and Norfolk coast and it washes up here. So this bit of land is constantly evolving and changing. It's actually really hard work walking over this shingle. It's going to be quite a tough walk on the legs today. So this, I believe, is a bomb ballistics building. It's the first stop on the, uh, on the Art Angel Trail, and this is the site associated with Ilya Kaminsky's 
poems, I See Silence, which are all about this location here. Quite haunting poems. I was reading them whilst waiting for the taxi at Woodbridge Station. So this building here contained equipment for measuring bombs that were dropped on the firing ranges out there. All sorts of weird and wonderful devices to do so, like a very powerful beam which sure was reflected by a series of mirrors and somehow that helped calculate the effectiveness of a bomb. It really is a haunting location, isn't it? You hear the sound of the wind, the howling wind across this desolate shingle shore. And the North Sea just out there. Here's one of Ilya Kaminsky's poems. While the young wind of Ness grips scraps of paper helpless in its hands, I surrender to you. Girls, you can have the afternoon. Such is the location, that droning sound. I'm not sure if that's the sound of the wind whipping through metal or the sound of an art installation. That's where there would have been a very powerful beam of light in the center of an array of mirrors used for measuring the, uh, the bomb blasts. Danger. Unexploded ordnance. Please keep to the visitor route. Roger Deeking, the wonderful nature writer who came out here with uh, Robert McFarlane, and it's in his book, Notes from Walnut Tree Cottage. He thinks that's actually nonsense, because if there were unexploded ordnance out here, we'd never be allowed to enter. The mysteriously named Black Beacon here it was constructed in 1927 for some early experiments with radio operations. Today it's a sound installation as part of the Art Angel uh, trail around here, including by the, the great Chris Watson has some field recorders in here. Unfortunately, we can't get out to the uh, Orford Ness Lighthouse. That, well, it doesn't exist anymore, but the site of it, it was there from the, uh, I think it was the 1790s it was originally built. And then it was uh, decommissioned and finally demolished in 2020 because it was being eroded and falling into the sea. And that part of the uh, shore is off limits today, unfortunately, so we can't get right down to the seafront, sadly a bit of a disappointment. You can imagine in the early days of the military experimentation here with uh, electromagnetic signals and radio waves and all that stuff, it may have played havoc <laughs> with instrumentation and TVs and radios over there in the town of Orford. And of course they'd have had no idea what it was about. They'd have just been able to, to speculate about it. And from the, the time the military took over here, Initially, I think even in, um, during the First World War, there were as many as a thousand people living and working over here on Orford Ness. I keep saying it, it's possibly one of the most extraordinary places I've ever been. It's right up there with the uh, active volcano I climbed in Sumatra, uh, Gunan Sabayak, I think it was called. This almost feels as peculiar and beguiling and mad and frightening in a way actually. This really is the world of kind of 40s and 50s science fiction and 70s and 80s Cold War paranoia. This is the landscape which encapsulates all of that. So these final buildings on the trail 
in some ways the most mysterious of all. These are the buildings from the 50s and 60s, the blast labs built by the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment. Necessarily a very secretive and mysterious organisation. This is Lab One. So the water in the centre of that building, that was, uh, that was there. That was a, a, a three metre deep pit filled with water. And that was used to measure the vibrations of the bomb blasts in the water. Isn't that amazing? And it's been, just been filling up with rainwater ever since. The UFO sighting at RAF Bentwaters in Rendlesham Forest has been described as Britain's Roswell. Well, if that's Britain's Roswell, this is Britain's Area 51. Such a mysterious place. And these buildings have got like a kind of temple-like structure, particularly the ones we're going to go up towards in a minute. They look like pagodas. And actually, they were designed that way for their characteristics, for the purposes of, of observing explosions. But it's interesting. There's a few that look like pyramids. They look like a more Mayan temples, particularly in their abandoned condition. Sebold writes about the way that there was this government document, this classified document, government document outlining plans to evacuate the population of Shingle Street, presumably in the case of some sort of accident. And it was classified for 75 years, which is longer than the usual amount of time. Eventually, access to the document was granted, but of course it had been heavily redacted and the secrets of Orford Ness remain forever occluded and out of sight. Will we ever know what went on here? I don't think so. This structure here is almost like a burial mound, like it's mimicking the ship burial at Sutton Hoo. Looking out across the North Sea here. I'm almost speechless actually. It's very difficult to encapsulate in words what it feels like to be here. It really is an absolutely astonishing landscape, the like of which you can't imagine there's anywhere else like this in the UK. Maybe there is. If you know of anywhere, please let me know in the comments. This is the type of experience that you need time to digest and formulate a response. It's like it'll hit me probably in about a week. <laughs> this is the armory. And this is where the, the bombs that were being tested by the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment were stored. So you imagine it's a pretty robust structure, wouldn't you? This is a sculpture by Emma McNally as part of the uh, Art Angel series of installations. This place seems to have the ability to warp time. I've been here three hours now and I feel like I've been here about 45 minutes. Unfortunately, the last boat leaves in less than an hour. It leaves in about 50 minutes. After that, the next boat from here is uh, in April 2022. So I'd better get a scoot on to get to the ferry and then we'll digest this when we get to the, back to the mainland, away from the, the Isle of Secrets.
Wow, what an astonishing experience. That's one of the most stunning places I've ever been. As I said, consistently throughout the entire time, but I haven't formulated a more uh, intellectual or coherent response other than that, and just to say, wow. Um, if you've not been before, I thoroughly recommend it, although you'll have to wait till at least April 2022 till the bus till the boat services start resuming and it opens once again but what an amazing place i'm just enjoying walking along the riverside here into the setting sun what a beautiful place to be so i'd like to thank you once again for joining me on this incredible adventure wow what a day out amazing thanks to my wonderful supporters on patreon Thanks to everyone that subscribed and liked and shared the videos. This is a collective journey. We're out here together. I'm just going to go back into Orford. I might have a pint here. Or I might have a pint in Woodbridge. I've got to get a cab to Woodbridge and then the train back to London. It's like I've been away for a decade rather than half a day. Take care. And as I always like to say, I look forward to seeing you on the next walk wherever that may be. And who thought we'd end up here? So you never know.